So this video is on an update to my Bifrost Editor Plus script, which mostly focuses around these paint frost nodes, but also I fixed a couple of bugs, uh, mainly with the script auto-loading correctly, it should now auto-load much more reliably, and also saving with layouts. So before, if the Bifrost Editor was saved with a layout, opening that layout, the script wouldn't load correctly into it. Um, that should be fixed now. For that to actually take effect though, the editor just needs to be closed, reopened, and then the uh, layout saved, just so those uh, new changes get saved with the layout. So the way this works is the main node here is the paint frost node, and this is where all the painting information comes from. It then just gets sent down through this stroke step data structure into the compounds, and it's up to the compounds that it's connected to to decide what to do with that data and how to process it. Um, so it's pretty simple to use. I just need to select some meshes and then just click paint selected and it'll begin to paint on those objects. Um, the output you're seeing is coming from this stroke scope node. Um, so this may be different depending on what you have it connected to. Uh, the paint last will just repeat the same operation. So if I were to go and do something else and work, you know, exit the tool, I can go back to exactly what the same objects I was painting before without having to reselect them. Um, and then flood is, will depend on how you implement it, but in this case, it'll clear out uh, everything I've painted. So um, I'm using a value node here and I can just break apart the data structure to see what's inside. So there's the position of the brush, the direction, um, the brush settings, so the radius and the value, which are set from the, the tool settings. Both of these options be, can be controlled through hotkeys, so B for brush size and N for value. And then everything else you'd want to change would be on this node or any of the nodes it's connected to. And so you never have to really open the brush settings. Then there's tablets, so if you're using a tablet, you'd want to enable this, um, and then you'll get that information sent through this section here. So the pen pressure, the tilt, and then this will be true when you're painting with the eraser side of the pen, and false uh, when you're painting with just the normal tip. And then stats is just a little more information about the stroke. So this one is really important. It'll be true when you're painting and false when you're not. A lot of these involve feedback ports, and those will keep evaluating even when you're doing other things. So if I were just go around and just change random settings, um, those feedback ports are still evaluating. So you can use this to kind of lock those off um, when you're not painting so they're not changing. Flood is, um, this comes from that button here. So this flood button, as I mentioned, it depends on how you implement it. But basically this just sends a signal. Um, so it'll always be false and then it'll turn true for one evaluation and then turn back off when you press flood just to give you a way to like do whole scale operations. So as I mentioned, in the case of the scope node here, it's gonna clear out all those strokes, but it could be used to control pretty much anything. Time is just the time in seconds of the stroke at every instance. So you can see uh, this value right here is where time come in, comes in. It'll start at zero at the beginning of the stroke, and then the longer it goes, it'll just keep increasing. Um, so you can kind of use this to you know, determine the velocity or just have a timestamp of when the instance of that stroke is. And lastly is keyboard modifiers. So this is just a unique integer that represents whatever keyboard buttons are being held at that time. So if I hold shift, for example, it's one. If I hold shift and control, it becomes five. Um, so you can just use these to add extra controls to your uh, compound. For example, like erase, smooth, or whatever. And to touch on the last few settings, uh, the step size is just how coarse or fine the stroke is. So you can see as I paint uh, with the step size one, the, the, each step is pretty close to each other. If I increase this, now the circles are more spread apart. And this is proportional to the brush size, so if I make the brush really big, those steps will be you know, proportionally the same distance apart. Next is the radius override. So the way Artisan works is it only updates when it's near a vertice. So if I paint with a small brush here, you can see it's not actually updating um, until you get close enough to one of these vertices and then it starts working again. So this is obviously a big problem if you wanna paint with a small brush. Um, and that's what this is for. So if I increase this to a value of one and then start painting, now you can see it's updating fine wherever I go. Um, if I turn on brush while painting, you can see what's going on here. So uh, what's actually being painted with is this radius of one, but what's re being reported to Bifrost is the original smaller radius. Um, so this basically lets you paint, you know, any size brush on any density of mesh. Um, one small caveat though, is if you go off the mesh and go back on, it messes up the stepping. But as long as you stay on the mesh the whole time, it's no problem. So as I mentioned, um, this is usually accommodated with some kind of feedback compound. So I'll just give an example of kind of like the simplest uh, style of compound you can make. And I'll just um, accumulate the position. So I'll use a build array node and then plug that in the input and output and then just make this a feedback port. So this will just accumulate all the points as I'm painting. Um, and I'll add a scope to this just so I can see what's being painted. 
And now you can see I've got just a basic, you know, point painting compound. Next, I wanted to go over these two utility nodes. So the stroke scope is just like any other scope, which lets you visualize uh, what's coming out of the paint frost node. And then the save strokes node is similar and where I can visualize what's coming out, but also saves these to a file. So if I go back to this one and I were to reset the feedback ports, everything's gone. But this one, those um, that result gets saved to a file as I'm painting. So even if I reset, they're still there. Now, aside from the saving functionality, they're pretty similar on the surface, but they work pretty differently. So if I go inside this one, the main part of this is this compound here, which is a kind of a feedback port that uh, creates the, the strands object. And you see the output of this is the strand object itself. So that's what's being iterated. Whereas this compound, um, the equivalent would be this part here. And you can see it's just accumulating the entire stroke. Um, and then that gets passed down eventually. And then the strand objects gets created from this array. So this method is good because it doesn't lose any data. If I wanted to change the, res uh, change the outcome, I could you know, edit this compound or whatever this is plugged into, and I could completely reinterpret the data as if I repainted it from scratch. Whereas this method, um, that data gets lost, but it's much more efficient because I'm not re-looping over all the strokes every single time I make a change. So if you're gonna be painting something where there's a lot, a lot of strokes, this method is probably better. But if you need something non-destructive that you want to be able to reinterpret, this method is definitely the way to go. And that's why this one has saving functionality and this one doesn't because this one doesn't store anything to save, whereas this stores everything. Um, by default, the um, save after stroke is enabled, so it's automatically just going to save every time I paint something. So if I go in and oh, I should turn this on, I start painting, it's just going to save every time I make a change. Um, you can turn this off and that way I'll have to explicitly say save, but it comes with the plus and where I can go back. So if I paint something and then I decide I don't like it, I can revert to last save and I get back to where I was. Um, these fields, of course, will be empty when you first create the node. So they'll just be um, you know, empty fields. Um, this button here will auto-populate these with a file that's next to the scene and then just a random key. So that way you can have multiple of these all saving to the same file, but they're not gonna be overwriting each other because they'll each have this kind of random key. There's also the scene data node, which is uh, where the save stroke node actually comes from. It works pretty much the same in which you create it and then you set path. The main difference is um, this is specific to strokes. This will take any kind of data. So I could pass in, you know, the whole object or an array of, you know, floats or whatever else, you know, just for general purpose saving. Um, so this works well if you have a compound that uses a method more like this node. Um, where you don't wanna you know, have to be saving and reevaluating all the strokes. You can just kind of say, all right, here's the final object, I wanna save that. Um, and one other thing to note about both of these is when they load the file, they load it into a feedback port so that way it's not reloading all the time. It only has to do it once. Um, what that means though, is if you make a change to the source file, you have to just explicitly uh, reload the file so it knows that there's changes to be loaded. So that pretty much covers it. I just wanted to show some of the setups I created while working on this to give some more practical examples. Uh, this first one here is for pa uh, paint scattering. So I can just draw here where I wanna create cones. And if you compare this to like um, the scatter points node, this of course gives me a lot more control. Um, I'm not limited to the resolution of the geometry when it comes to like painting a mask or whatever. Um, I can make them as dense as I want in one area or as light as I want in one area. Um, I can erase with shift. Um, and then if I enable tablet, I'm using pen pressure to drive the size. So I can start painting, uh, I can paint you know, hard for full size or if I go really light, it'll only paint them um, down to a scale of like 0.4. So it gives you a lot of control and the performance is really good. I can even turn this number up and paint a lot of these at a time and it still updates pretty well. Um, I've gotten up to a few, a few million points and it was still fine. I mean, obviously it slows down eventually, but I can paint points for a while before um, it starts getting too slow. Um, as far as how it works, uh, let me go ahead and just clear this out. I'm using this node here first to do a ray cast. And this just, you know, ray cast where the brush, based on the brush's radius, um, to determine where the, you know, the actual objects should be created. Um, you know, you can make this in a lot of different ways. Ray cast is one, uh, get close location is another. Um, and so that determines the position, you know, an array of positions for the brush, as well as the rotation of the object, you know, based on the, um, the tangent and the, the normal. And that passes it into this node, which does the actually accumulating. And you can see this works more like the scope, where it's accumulating the actual object and not actually storing any of the actual stroke information. So this graph is for painting actual attributes on an existing object. It also shows how you could um, set up with scene data nodes. So um, I can just paint here to redirect the direction of these arrows. 
I can increase the value of the brush to paint more strongly. Um, and then I can hold shift to uh, revert back to where it was. And then the, save, or the scene data nodes on either side, they're both um, using the same file and key. And then this one just does the saving. And then when, whenever feedback ports get reset, this one does the loading. So I can save this. And then if I were to reopen the scene or clear feedback ports, um, this one is gonna do the loading and just put me right back to where I left off. Um, and then the reason I'm still piping in the original, that way it's just the, uh, the shift to revert is still works because um, if I were to, for example, plug this into both, then when I hold shift and paint, it's gonna go back to the last save state, which might be useful. I could maybe have both um, and just use different keys or something, but it all just comes to, uh, depends on how you wanna set things up. This one also is good for showing off symmetry. Um, I haven't mentioned it yet, but you can actually just turn on uh, reflection in the brush settings and symmetry just kind of works out of the box. So now I can paint here and you can see it's applying on both sides. Um, one thing to note is the evaluation order. It's gonna be evaluating like back and forth, like ping ponging between both sides. So if you're painting like strands or something, um, it's gonna like weave them between uh, both sides. So just something to be aware of. Um, in that case, it might be simpler to just do the, um, the symmetry you know, logic inside the compound itself. But for things like this, it's really easy to just turn on and it just works. So the last one is my attempt at kind of a rudimentary sculpting tool. So I can um, just click around to paint and um, you know, deform the mesh. Um, so there's a sphere mesh coming in, it gets processed, and then it, the output gets converted to a Maya mesh. That way I can actually paint on it. So I'm painting on the actual output of this graph. So I'm getting this kind of feedback where the mesh changes and then the brush actually is affected by that change. I've got some you know, basic controls, like I can use the profile to control the shape of it, just like a normal sculpting tool. Um, and then what's kind of cool is I'm using a subdivide node inside the feedback port. So as I paint this, um, every stroke it's actually resubdividing the mesh and kind of adding extra polygons if I wanted to like pull out some weird appendage <laughs> from the object, I'll get more polygons for that. Uh, I'm not trying to replace ZBrush, don't expect to anytime soon, but kind of just a cool uh, proof of concept. I'm not sure though what the practical uses will be. I'm also using a smooth mesh node, so if I hold shift and then click around, I can smooth it. Uh, it just applies to the whole mesh just because there's no simple way to, um, to control where this affects. But again, it's just more of a, a little experiment than any kind of serious tool.